A Lesson Before Dying, Chapter 13 Not long after the second bell rang at the church, I heard Miss Eloise Bowie out in the road calling my aunt. I went onto the porch and told her that my aunt was in the back. Miss Eloise, tall and thin, stood in the road, leaning on her bamboo walking stick. She wore a long black overcoat and a black hat with a white band. She was looking up the quarter. She said she thought there was a new chill in the air, and I agreed with her. While she waited for my aunt, she continued to look up the quarter toward the church. I didn't feel like standing out on the porch, but I thought it would be rude to go inside and leave her in the road with no one to talk to. I heard my aunt come into the house from the backyard. She was in her room only a moment before, and she walked out on the porch. She wore the black overcoat, the black coat over the black dress, white stockings, and low-heeled black shoes. Hey there, Elu, she called out. Hey, Miss Eloise called back. She really stretched it out. Hey. Ain't been waiting too long, I hope, my aunt said. Just getting here, Miss Eloise said. Be sure you shut them doors if you leave from here, my aunt said to me. She was already halfway down the steps when she said it. She had not looked at me. Years ago, she had quit looking at me when she was on her way to church. When I came back from the university, I told her that I didn't believe anymore, and I didn't want her to try forcing it on me. If she did, I told her, then I would have to look for some other place to live. She didn't want me to leave, so she let me alone. Only occasionally, when she had some other church member at the house, would she bring it up. Even then, she wouldn't press it too far. She and Miss Eloy started up the quarter, one tall and slim, the other short and much heavier. They stopped in front of Miss Emma's house, and I heard my aunt calling her, Emma, hey there, Emma. Miss Emma came out of the house, and the three of them continued up on, on up to the church together. I went back inside. I had started correcting papers a couple hours earlier, but I hadn't done very much. On Sunday, my aunt began getting ready for church as soon as she woke up, which was around six o'clock. Until 11 o'clock, there was nothing I could do but listen to her singing her Termination song. The Termination Sunday was the third Sunday of each month, when members of the church would stand and sing their favorite hymns and tell the congregation where they were determined to spend eternity. My aunt started warming up at 6 in the morning, whether it was Termination Sunday or not, and didn't quit until 11, when she walked out of the house so I would be forced to put away the work until after she had gone, or I would go for a walk through the quarter and back into the field. I sat at my table trying to correct papers, but my mind kept drifting back to Friday. It had been dark when I returned to the quarter from Bayonne. It was colder, too. I could see sparks of fire rising out of chimneys. When I stopped in front of Miss Emma's house, Farrell Giroux, who lived across the road, told me she had gone to my aunt's house. I said good night to him and went down the quarter. I recognized Reverend Ambrose's car parked before the door. Now I felt a little guilty for getting back so late. The three of them were in the kitchen drinking coffee, Reverend Ambrose, Miss Emma, and my aunt. They were quiet, sitting in semi-darkness. The only light in the kitchen came from the open door of the stove. No one looked around when I came in and Reverend Ambrose and Miss Emma barely answered when I spoke their names. My aunt was completely silent. I went to the icebox and took out a, the picture, pitcher of water, and while I poured a glass full, I looked at the three of them at the table. They were quiet, not even drinking their coffee now. I'll be in my room, I said to my aunt. That's all you got to say? She snapped at me. I spoke, Taunt Lou. You know what I'm talking about. He was all right, I said. That's all, my aunt said, or did you forget to go? I went, and he was all right, I said. You got more than that to say, Mr. Mann, my aunt said. Folks been sitting here hours waiting for you. I see you recovered from your cold, Miss Emma. I'm glad it wasn't too. Sit down, my aunt said. I went around the table and pulled out the fourth chair. He was all right, I said. My aunt looked at me. Reverend Ambrose and Miss Emma stared out into the yard. 
That's not what she wants to hear, my aunt said. How he was when you got there, how he was when you left. He was all right both times, I said. You know what I'm talking about, my aunt said. She looked at me the way an inquisitor must have glared at his poor victims. The only reason she didn't put me on the rack was that she didn't have one. We both ate some of the food and we talked, I said. All this time, as Emma had been gazing into the yard, now she looked at me, no, toward me. Her thoughts were far distant. He ate? Some, I said. Y'all talked? Her mind was still far away. A little, I said. Now her focus became closer, much closer. She was looking at me now. What y'all talking about? Different things. I told him you didn't come to see him because you had a bad cold. She looked at me, waiting to hear his answer. But I couldn't think of another lie, so I shifted to something else. When I Then I asked him how he was getting along. He said he was all right. The deputy had already told me he was okay. Gidry was in the office today. He said that Jefferson was getting along fine, didn't cause any trouble. He is using that comb and brush I bought for him, and he was wearing one of my shirts, the khaki ones. I think he's doing okay. Miss Emma and my aunt both studied me. Miss Emma wanted to believe what I was saying, but I could see she had doubts. My aunt still wanted to put me on the rack. And Reverend Ambrose continued to look out into the darkness. What else y'all talked about, my aunt said. You left from here for one thirty. I can't remember everything we talked about, I said. We just talked. More than five hours and you can't remember nothing else? I was with him about an hour. Then I went back a town. I have a girl back a town. I like to see her sometime. And maybe that's where you spent all your time. If you didn't, if you don't think I went to the jail, you can always go up there and ask him. I didn't ask for none of your uppity, mister. I don't mean to be uppity, I told her. I'm just telling you the truth. I spent an hour with him. I had a drumstick and a biscuit, and he had something. I can't remember exactly what it was. Then we talked. Then I left and went back to town. Exactly what I did. Deep in you, what you think, Reverend Ambrose suddenly turned from looking out into the darkness. Deep in you. About what, Reverend? Him. What's he thinking? What's he thinking deep in him? Deep in you, what you think? Who knows what someone else is thinking? They say one thing, they may be thinking about something else. Who can tell? You the teacher, my aunt said, not so kindly. Deep in you, Reverend Ambrose said. Deep in you, you think he know. He done grasped the significance of what it's all about. Deep in you, the significance, the gravity. The gravity? Reverend Mose Ambrose was a short, very dark man, whose face and bald head were always shining. He was the plantation church's pastor. He was not educated, hadn't gone to any theological school. He had heard the voice and started preaching. He was a simple, devoted believer. He christened babies, baptized youths, and visited those who were ill, counseled those who had trouble, preached, and buried the dead. All these things could be simply accomplished, but when it came to a discussion with the teacher, though he had known the teacher since his birth, then suddenly things were not so simple. His soul, he said. I don't know anything about the soul, Reverend Ambrose. I baptized him, Rambr Reverend Ambrose said. He was 11 or 12 then, but like so many others, he didn't keep the faith either, like yourself. Sorry, I don't know that one. He stared at me as though I was one of the worst of sinners. Maybe I was. Backsliders were usually worse than those who had never been converted. At least that is what people like him tried to make you believe. Y'all talked about God, he asked me? No, sir. We didn't get around to that. Didn't get around to God? No, sir. He looked at me and nodded his head. If we didn't talk about God... And what else on earth was important enough to talk about to someone who was about to meet God? I figured that's where you came in, Reverend. There's enough room for both of us. I can tell you that. Me, Sister Emma, Sister Lou going up there Monday. 
he said. Anything I ought to take him? Food, I suppose. Maybe some clean clothes. I can't think of anything else. I was thinking more about the Bible, Reverend Ambrose says. That would be nice too, I said. Reverend Ambrose did not have any more to say. He and my aunt continued to stare at me until I excused myself and left the table. Now on Sunday, as I sat at the table trying to do my work, I could hear them singing in the church. It seemed that I had listened to the singing and their praying every Sunday of my life. No, I had done more than just listened. I participated until my last year at the university. There was no one thing that changed my faith. I suppose it was a combination of many things, but mostly it was just plain studying. I did not have time for anything else. Many times I would not come home on weekends, and when I did, I found that I cared less and less about the church. Of course, it pained my aunt to see this change in me, and it saddened me to see the pain I was causing her. I thought many times about leaving, as Professor Antoine had advised me to do. My mother and father also told me that if I was not happy in Louisiana, I should come to California. After visiting them the summer following my junior year at the university, I came back, which pleased my aunt but I had been running in place ever since, unable to accept what used to be my life, unable to leave it. I pushed away the papers and listened to the singing. Miss Alois was singing her termination song. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? You could hear that high, shrill voice all over the plantation. I had been hearing it all my life, all my life. After her, there would be someone else, then someone else. It would go on for three or four hours, and it was impossible to do anything but listen to it or leave. I thought I heard a car stop before the door, but I didn't leave the table. Then I thought I heard someone come onto the porch, and when I looked up, I saw her standing in the doorway. But I did not believe it was she, because she had never come here before. She wore a blue blazer and a maroon pleated skirt. A black patent leather purse hung from her white, right shoulder. I hope you don't mind. Only if I'm dreaming. She smiled and came into the room, 